India is known for its rich history and tradition. However, we are at an inflection point where our contemporary lifestyle demands are clashing with our living in harmony with nature. Uh, to set the context, annual studies from last year reveal for the second year, consecutive year, India is likely to register the largest growth in CO2 emissions among the major economies. Coal is around 44% contributor for our energy sources and petroleum and others are around 24%. So in this panel discussions, uh, we have our uh, panelists who will be uh, taking us through the solutions they are building to navigate through the challenges. So I request the panelists, uh, Mr. Amit and Sir Hugh, to introduce yourself and the kind of work you are doing in the sector. To begin. Okay. Alphabetically. So good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks for this opportunity from Entrepreneur India to be on this panel. Uh, my name is Amit Barve and uh, I work as a business unit head for solar and industrial vertical in Panasonic in India. And uh, we have been involved in two, uh, two types of businesses, one of uh, selling the renewable energy products like solar modules and inverters, while we also do the project business where we establish the solar power plants for commercial and industrial consumers uh, for their captive consumption. And in the industry vertical, we have been adding new products related to the energy like EV chargers as well as smart meters as an additional portfolio. Uh, these are like a new businesses which we are incubating right now in India. And uh, uh, as a Panasonic, we have our own captive manufacturing here in India for these products. And uh, we have a distribution across the country and uh, managing almost more than asset of more than 100 megawatts what we have installed in India on an ONM basis also. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting us on the panel. I'm Nasheem and uh, currently I'm the director of uh, the entire EV program and new initiatives at Log9. So Log9 fundamentally is a R&D based nanotechnology company. So our core is uh, research on nanotechnologies and uh, our expertise lies in uh, developing, creating and manufacturing high quality batteries, EV batteries and lithium ion cells. In fact, we're the only company in India who has commercialized a uh, lithium ion cell manufacturing facility here in Bangalore. Uh, it's a small facility of 50 megawatt hour, but yeah, the, the seeds are there and it's the only plant with uh, self-developed technology. Apart from that, uh, we have a downstream, so these are upstream business. In downstream business, we have a mobility play where we are engaged in deployment and managing EV assets and stationary energy solution assets around. Uh, so how can India, according to you, uh, balance growth and sustainability in its journey to net zero? So, uh, we, uh, we do this kind of a cash to into situation uh, almost daily in our life, which with our customers, investors, or internal uh, team members. Uh, for us, the fundamental uh, uh, leeway on, on defining this, uh, this conflict is, you know, you have to be very clear what sustainability is. So for us, sustainability is a triangulation of my business health, uh, my societal good, and my climate. So the reason this growth and sustainability conflict happens because we, we see sustainability as a synonymous thing with climate. So you do good to climate and you hamper your growth. Whereas we feel sustainability in its true form should be looked at something which can you know, do good today, making sure that your future is also conserved you know, and that can be self-sustaining. So, this definition for ourselves is uh, is giving us all the clarity to you know manage our growth and sustainability because we don't take any decision uh, which checks one of the boxes of these triangulated metrics like environment or social or business and hamper our growth. So we balance these two things, and I think the key for us is just being very clear that sustainability cannot be a one-sided metric. It is triangulated across three different variables. As long as you optimize for these three variables, your growth and sustainability will go hand in hand. How much to add on to it? So, uh, in my opinion, actually, uh, climate change is real. Sustainability is the need of the time, actually. Yeah. So, irrespective of uh, whether we like it, we don't like it, I think so, we will have to adopt it, actually. Uh, Government of India is taking a target of 2070 uh, to become a net neutral as far as carbon emissions are concerned. 
Uh, but what I believe is the way the technologies are evolving, I think so we will be able to reach to this target even well before the time. And this is where I see that we need not actually compromise growth or we need not have to look as a paradigm where we have to compare growth versus sustainability. Uh, irrespective of whether there are financial benefits or no, we have to strengthen and we have to move ahead actually. A uh, couple of examples just to see how the things are changing uh, with the technology. Uh, you know, uh, I will talk more on the energy perspective since my background comes from that. If you see the solar energy 10 years back was pretty expensive. It was almost like 17 rupees per kilowatt hour and today it is sub 3 rupees actually, which means it is even cheaper than coal. Uh, so that adoption and rapid adoption was the only way we were able to make it sustainable. Today still it has a problem that uh, solar is only a daytime power, it cannot be around the clock, uh, probably people like you uh, pitching in with a battery and cheaper storages uh, with alternate sources like hydrogen, uh, even uh, pump storage uh, can make differences to make around the clock power actually. Uh, but as we started adopting, things started becoming better. If things would not have been taken by government with a push at that point of time, probably we would not have seen the tariffs what we see it in solar today, making it sustainable. So in my opinion, let's not, I think so we should not compare to look at whether we should compromise on growth or we should go for sustainability. I think so it should go hand in hand actually. So he basically touched upon the uh, thing that, you know, in the era of tech a lot is happening. So from your perspective, how can we leverage technology to attain our sustainability goals? So, I think it's a very broad uh, question in itself, but I'll try to address it as per my domain uh, that we are working on. So, sustainability, um, again, it's a, it's an age-old concept and thought. It's, there is nothing new in it. But a lot of uh, push or expectation is being given on it in the 21st century. And that's when we see all the boom of technology, consumer internet, and digitization as per the global Indian context. So uh, if you if you have a one word answer like how tech can solve for sustainability is all of a sudden there is a huge expectation for the stakeholders, business, customers, society to deliver on sustainability through their own in their own capacity. And tech or digitization is helping us to discover where we are currently. That's that's the that's the basic fundamental uh, purpose of any tech that we are trying to induce in sustainability, forget about, and I am talking purely from the Indian context, I am not going to take it uh, in a leaps and bound across any global context. At least in the Indian context, any tech or uh, digitization that is happening uh, to enable sustainability is to make sure that people or the stakeholders who are supposed to deliver on the expectation of sustainability are aware where they are currently. So be it an IoT device, be it any, any application, be it any platform that's coming in, a lot of stakeholders are adopting them or using them just to discover that, okay, this is my current emission, this is where I'm currently in, this is where I should be, and this is where I can be. And, uh, and as long as any tech that is coming in this ecosystem to direct the stakeholders, not uh, forget about large organization, be it a common man like you and me, uh, who you know uses a lot of there are a lot of applications or uh, you know platforms available for uh, consumers to discover what are their daily carbon footprints. So you know all this technology which can just make people aware where they are currently is is at least more than enough for for the current scenario to you know enable sustainability uh, in their own sense for the re every stakeholder in their own capacity. Thank you. Uh, you also touched upon the point of funding. Right. So, do you think we need to bridge the gap between funding and climate change? Uh, yeah, it's actually an it's interesting thing if you see, uh, again going back to how the, uh, the scenario has been evolving in India. Uh, 2011, when the National Solar Mission started actually, uh, solar was pretty new. It has been only being used maybe on off-grid projects in India, which was uh, very small in scale, not much amount of proven performance in India. Uh, technology was still getting adopted and uh, there was a dearth of funding because no one was ready to come ahead and put the money into the projects actually. And the severity of it was felt that the projects were not moving ahead in spite of government pushing everything. Uh, there probably government made a very, uh, I would say, bold step to come with 
kind of uh, SPVs where the funding got channel, the government funding got channel through NTPCs or SECI, uh, so that the money is available onto the block rather than just looking at uh, private equity or other sources of funding. But as the technology started getting established, you start seeing the performance of these projects going as per what was expected in terms of performance, I think, so that funding bridge or gap actually just went on going up. To an extent today we can say the available line of credits uh, on solar projects is in excess. In fact, it's not getting utilized fully. So today more or less all the projects are getting properly funded actually. But this has happened over a period of a decade when the performance of a new technology got established. And I think so today we stand on the cusp of many new technologies getting launched in India where there is no proven track record and performance. I think so there has to be an enabler from the government to push this actually. Because once that happens and it starts rolling out to showcase the performance, I think so that is the time when the funding will also be available. Yeah, and I don't think so there is a lack of capital into the market. It is only whether they would like to put the money at this stage or wait and watch before they really put the money into it. Do you want to add on to it? Yeah, like a uh, pretty valid point, like I know how and it's coming from a live journey of how government and all the organization can intervene to come across uh, this development. But for me, um, I think it's a function of risk. Uh, so every capital provider, be it a private capital, be it government capital or be it any capital, public capital is uh, is expecting returns. And uh, again, and, and the returns are coming at a cost and that's tied to the risk that that is applicable in the market and the risk that they understand and again what is the appetite to take that risk so i think what uh, amit said is like you know people are waiting waiting and watching to you know jump into the uh, in the foray or how th uh, technology unfolds i think a lot of the stakeholders are lacking who are sitting with this capital are lacking the understanding of the risk and even if they understand the risks uh, they are not having the appetite to digest that risk uh, because it's fairly new so, uh, if you ask me fundamentally, uh, again, we, we have developed newer technologies, we have pushed new technologies in the market, breathing lithium and differentiated chemistries, battery cell technology, which nobody understood in the market. But again, we have a technology which nobody understands. So, and again, we banged our head across multiple capital providers, consumers, and we developed one fundamental thesis, like, you know, it's a, it's a risk which people are failing to understand. So, we figured out, okay. Risk is a business of insurance companies and they're insurance company, reinsurance companies who understand it better than any capital provider. So I think a lot of it can be solved if, if, we are, if a lot of these risks are tied up into a, into a product which can be you know, uh, harnessed by entities who are in the business of dealing in risk and that can accelerate this entire thing. You said when you begin it was like you know most people did not understand the technology what you were working into so no people understood the technology but again that they didn't understand the risk and that has a premium attached to it so okay. if i'm coming the technology so, it's good but again nobody is willing to pay a 3x price for it because again so it from the time you began and now so do you see an improvement yeah yeah, yeah. so again that's what i'm saying when we started uh, when all the premium uh, pricing were there and Customers were sensing the benefit, but again, uh, not willing to not pay the willing price to pay because it's a risk. So we needed someone to, you know, find, uh, fund the risk. So we started our journey by engaging a lot of these reinsurance insurance companies, and again, entities who are in the business of dealing with risk. And slowly and gradually, those are in the back end now. So earlier, all these entities who are in the business of dealing in risk used to be at the front end to, you know, take all those exposure. Now they are at the back end because in the preceding three to five years, people have understood, they have seen enough data, they have seen the trend and now they don't need the, they don't have the need to, you know, have a third party to underwrite the risk for them. So I think a lot of it acceleration was done because of the presence of strong underwriting from entities involved in dealing with risk. You want to add something to it? So this, this risk no, factor, this my closing you. statement was on risk, but we got it midway. So. <laughs> No, but I think so. Is what I mentioned is also a very interesting point is that understanding of the technology is, is the key of it actually. And then how much are you ready to take the risk? And uh, having a knowledgeable people about the innovation and industry uh, on the part of funding agencies is very, very equally important. 
I think so that way on the energy side, especially the reason why probably solar moved very fast was there was enough knowledge into the market, there were enough experts into the market, even though may not be in India. I think so there were a couple of experiences which have already happened in Europe and Western countries actually, uh, where the talent was already there. Uh, they have underwritten the investments which have been done in those regions actually, if not in India. And they had that experience which could be deployed here. So a lot of Indian banks also took the expertise especially coming from Europe where Germany was a leader in this particular segment and that is the reason probably they were able to move pretty fast as probably compared to other technologies where probably we see struggle uh, happening as, as far as the funding is concerned. So from a consumer point of view, if I uh, look at environmentally friendly products, they are a little costlier as well. So do you see the space improving? Is there an increased uh, number of the the sales number, if I say, of are people more consuming more of uh, the premium products right now? Uh, yeah. In fact, it's, it's a mixed bag, I would say. On the consumer side, the adoption has been slow, no yeah. doubt about it. Uh, but today, especially the energy related product are still financially viable. So they are sustainable as well as financially viable. Uh, the, the, the paradigm right, right now, as far as consumer side is concerned, is how can we popularize it? How can we take the messaging to every household? Mm -hmm. Because the adoption is still limited because of the lack of awareness. Uh, maybe three, four years back, I would say lack of funding on the B2C side. The funding was more on the B2B and larger projects actually, but on B2C side, it was lacking. Uh, but today, if you see that ecosystem is getting well developed, I think so there are a lot of NBFCs who have come up with the products, which are very easy. And as if like, as of you go into the retail outlets and uh, buy your uh, uh, white goods. Uh, I think so it has gone to that level actually where it is becoming more simplified. The loans are getting sanctioned within a matter of four to five days actually if you have all the documents in place. Uh, so as far as funding mechanism, uh, availability of funding products, uh, everything is in place as far as B2C is concerned. Uh, lack of awareness is only the one which uh, is lacking. But I think so currently if you see the way the government is pushing with different schemes and other things, that awareness level is also going high. And especially in solar, what we have found is that there is a, a good amount of niche customer who do understand their role in the society towards the net zero or at least helping the, helping the environment to make it better. And uh, if the case is very, very close, where, whether it's a financially viable or not, if it is still not working out, uh, they don't mind paying a bit amount of extra but just to have it because it's a futuristic and they say this is good for my future for my next generation. Uh, so Panasonic is a global company. So I would like to understand, you know, what are in terms of supply chain? So what are the in-house solutions you are building for procurements and to bring down the, you navigate the challenges about yeah, I think so at Panasonic, we have doing multiple things, I would say. Uh, first and foremost, Panasonic Global is running uh, an entire uh, campaign called the Green Impact. Under Green Impact, we have taken our own goals of mitigating 300 million tons of CO2 uh, mitigation by 2050. And uh, the first goal is that we change ourselves first, uh, that we become net zero, then enable the consumers to become net zero. And taking that as a third step is to give the technologies to the third party to make them net zero actually. So in the first goal, uh, our internal goal we have decided is by 2030, we want to make all our operating units globally net zero. And uh, I'm very happy to say that almost 30 units are getting converted 100% on renewables uh, by next year. Uh, seven units are already running and this is made using combination of solar storage batteries as well as hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, so these factories are all totally running now on renewables around the clock power. So these are the initiatives which Panasonic has taken internally and including India, all our plants, seven plants in India are having the entire solar rooftop build up, uh, almost like 20% of the energy currently is being using renewables, but we are also committed by 2030, we'll make all the plants run on 100% renewables actually. Uh, maybe another an initiative I would say is that on the supply chain side, what we are doing actually. So we are going very close to the places of consumption actually, that's another strategy what we have done. So the product what we manufacture, solar modules, uh, traditionally it used to come either from Malaysia or Japan. It used to be imported and sold in India. Uh, but again, looking at the benefit, what we want to do by locally doing it, avoiding the transportation and, and 
CO2 mitigation against uh, the transportation, what we started looking at localization. Today we have three OEM manufacturing facilities in India, uh, one in China and we are about to start in Turkey. So different facilities are catering to the different logistic zones actually. And within India what we have also done is rather than shipping out the modules from western part to south and east and everywhere, we are actually even giving, going hyper local by looking at the OEMs in the specific region like going south, going west, going north so that the supplies can happen locally within those centers to avoid the transportation as much as possible. Good to know that. Would you like to add on to it the in-house procurement, how you are doing on in-house procurements and what are, what are the steps you are taking? Yeah, I think uh, I'm pretty much in sync with what Amit said but I'd like to add on uh, to the pricing part that you said. Uh, so, if you look at uh, pricing when you say affordability is a, is a challenge for the end customer, so it's a function of two things again. Uh, is the product expensive because of the component like the ingredients or the processes? So, most of the time you will see uh, in case of any new technology that's being, uh, uh, you know, aimed at sustainability, it's the process which is, which is, uh, which is making the product expensive. So, and the reason why processes are expensive is because we mo most of the time we end up borrowing processes from western part or from outside India and there is a cost attached to it. So, affordability is a, is a challenge uh, till, till the time we develop our own processes as per our own context. And second, I think it's an extrinsic thing. Uh, most of the time we end up pitching the wrong product in the wrong market or the right product in the wrong market. And that's when we see uh, a conflict in affordability and pricing. So, as long as intrinsically we are sorted with the product and processes and e extrinsically if we are uh, sorted with the product market fit, I don't think affordability will be an issue in, in our country right now. With that, uh, you said sometimes people end up pitching the right product in the wrong market. Okay, so have you figured out a way, how can we do that, like you know pitching the right product in the right market? Yeah, and yeah, so I think right product, wrong market is, is a function of how the product is built. So, I will tell you in our case also, we also had a similar scenario where we pitched a right product in the wrong market. We call the product right because it is still existing, it is still the core of what we do. And the reason is uh, the creator of the products or the innovator of the products are most of the time not the right person to do a business on that product and that is the reason you see a mismatch. So, given the talent pool that we have, given the skill that we have in the country, I think a good amalgamation of folks who can do business and folks who can create or innovate is, is, the, is the, you know, key secret sauce to make sure that we have the right product in the right market. Thank you. Uh, do we have any question from the audience? I think. All right. Can we have the, the mic being handed over there, please? For this session, we will only be taking one question as we are running short of time. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Paritosh. Again, a very thought-provoking discussion. Uh, my question is very basic and laymanish. So, uh, there is a notion that uh, to go green also and to reduce the emissions, uh, there is a requirement of a lot of raw material and there is a lot of transportation which happens for that. And that in itself uh, generates a lot of CO2, you know, air transportation and everything. So, if you could just throw some light on this aspect, is it actually true that to create green, we have to, you know, we have to be polluting the environment for the lack of a better word by CO2, you know, like the whole, uh, the irony of it all, if you could just throw some light. I think you touched upon being hyper local about it, right? As far as uh, solar radiation is concerned, if you see the statistics of the solar panels getting manufactured uh, and the energy consumption as well as the uh, I would say when I say energy it's not only electricity but even the fuel and other thing I think so the energy payback is less than 10 years actually uh, it's still intensive it's not that it is totally out of it and that's one of the reason why we are looking at localizing the value chains so rather than importing the entire raw material at a different locations what we are trying to do is locally manufacture and use the product local for the distribution rather than transporting from different continents actually. So that's one of the steps which should go but the entire raw material still is not getting manufactured in India. Still we have dependency on the external supply chains where still I think so work is in progress in India with lot of PLI schemes the entire value chain will be manufactured in India. Once that happens probably will be far more better position where your energy payback will come around three and a half years to four years actually. 
would add to that? Yeah, I think uh, the right uh, concept that we should look at. I, you are saying that we have to pollute. I think we should be very clear. Poor choice of word. No, no, I think we should be very clear that whether we, what is the intent? The intent is to be net zero or it, the intent is to be carbon neutral. Okay. So, and both are, we use those two words very interchangeably, but this very, this is a very drastic distinction. There are processes which requires carbon emission. Carbon is a part of our life. But again, can we be carbon neutral? Yes. If you are, if you are flying something by an airplane or transporting something by polluting ships, we can be carbon neutral by offsetting them. The question is, are we claiming carbon neutral or are we claiming net zero? And most of the time you will see entities have clear, have been uh, you know contemplating that they want to be carbon neutral. Net zero is a big deal where you have to change a lot of things fundamentally. But uh, with all the processes, wherever pollution that we do in logistics, whether it be scope 1, 2 or 3, carbon neutral is the solution as of now. And sooner or later when we go, when we have change, revamp our processes in infra, we can aim for net zero. But right now carbon neutral is 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 the priority that what we see perfect thank you so much cheers